OK, so this is the eight fallacies of distributed computing. Uh, my name is Steven Asbury. I work at Fog Creek Software on a product called Kiln. Woo! OK, there they are. Uh, I used to work at a company called Tibco Software, which turns out it's one of the sponsors. I had no idea. I worked in the messaging group there. Before that, I worked at the prerequisite startup that died in the internet bus. Before that, I worked at Next Computer. And before that, I was a grad student in nuclear engineering, which I finished somewhere in the midst of those other bullets, but I don't want to admit where it was. Let's just say it took me four decades to finish my PhD. But we'll move on. So I first heard about the eight fallacies at Java 1 a long time ago from James Gosling. And it turns out they have this very rich history, which is cool. And you can read about it. I'm using Wikipedia as if it's the truth. So I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But anyway, the eight fallacies, I think, are a really good way to kind of capture what's in people's subconscious, right? The mistakes we make because it's in our subconscious. So most of my talk is not going to be big words. So if you want big words, you should leave. If you, if you know somebody who doesn't like big words, text them and have them come back in the room so I can have a big audience. So the first thing, fallacy is something that's wrong, like a wrong thinking, a wrong belief, a bad idea. And I'm going to try to stick with saying the fallacies as the fallacies. So. If somewhere in the middle of the talk you're like, why is this guy telling me something that is blatantly not true, that is my intention throughout the entire talk. If I say something that's true by accident, that's an accident. OK? Go back to the fallacies. The fallacies are the real thing. The second thing is I'm really trying to get into your subconscious here. I really, really want you to be scared when you leave this talk. That is my goal, is to scare you. Right? So if you don't like being scared, you should leave now. Boom. Backhoes, very scary. I'll tell you why. When I started working at Next, I used to teach people how to program Objective-C and Next Step. So I'd travel around, and we'd have a class, and it would be really fun. One day, I'm in Michigan. We're teaching a class to a company. I can't say the name. Everything's going great. I'm doing a great job, kind of like I am right here. It's really good. Everybody's happy. And the power goes out. So we're looking around. What's going on? What's going on? The emergency lights come up. The mainframe turns on. That's how old I am. It's OK. We look outside, and there's a backhoe that just dug through the power cable. Right? The network is reliable, fallacy number one. This is always true. Boom, the network is reliable. In 2008, someone climbed down a manhole in San Jose and cut through the fiber optic cable. April 2008. In April 2013, someone else did the exact same thing. I don't know about you. I think it's something to do with taxes. OK, the second fun part of my talk, this is fun, not scary, is I have some little bonus prizes. I don't have a prize. You don't get anything if you know where the picture's from. Shining. Shining. That was easy. Don't feel good about yourself. <laughs> it gets harder. It gets harder. Boom, sharks. The network is reliable. Google wraps their fiber optic cables. Why they have fiber optic cables in the ocean, I don't know. But they're Google. It's not my job. They wrap them in Kevlar and steel. Why? The sharks like to eat them. That doesn't make any sense, right? So I had to read about it. It turns out, if you know anything about fiber optics, they have lasers, you know, light going through a cable. And it wears out over time. It's not perfect. So the light gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And then you put a little repeater. But the repeater uses electricity. So they put an electric cable in with the fiber optic cable. The electricity creates a little electromagnetic field around the cable. Now the cable looks like food to a shark. It looks actually like distressed food that's like, ah, because it's got this electromagnetic field. And so the shark tries to eat the cable. They have to protect the cable. The network is reliable. Fallacy number one. Fallacy number two. I can work this projector thing. <laughs> latency is zero. If you've been to some of the other talks on distributed computing, you know what latency is. But let me just say it again. Latency is time to travel on the network, basically. right? We measure it like time from message to get from me to the other place. Usually, though, when we do a test, we measure it to get to the other place and back, because that's easier and because clocks don't 
work really in distributed systems. So latency is the time it takes to get from here to there. And latency is money to certain people, OK? Spread Networks, for those who've read Flash Boys maybe or something else, is a company that laid a fiber optic line from New York, really New Jersey, to Chicago, really I don't think Chicago, but somewhere near Chicago, so that they could get a faster connection between the data centers for the traders. They shaved off a couple milliseconds. I want you to think about that. A couple milliseconds for which they paid millions of dollars to make a slightly straighter fiber optic cable than the one the phone company would give them. OK? So they paid millions of dollars for that. Let's just to compare. If you want to read from like an SSD, it's like 100 microseconds. From memory, it's like some number of nanoseconds. So we're, like, we're already 10 times what reading from disk and like 100 or more times from reading from memory. But they're paying money to move it, OK? Now, here's the problem for spread networks. Someone came back and said, ha, 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 ha. We're going to build something with towers and radio. And it's going to go even straighter. And they're shaving more milliseconds off. And they're actually using millimeter waves instead of, mic instead of microwaves because they can compress the data better. So latency is 0. Oh, my build didn't work. Oh, well. OK, my favorite latency is zero talk uh, story, which may or may not be true. I believe it's true, but with fakeness to it. That's OK, because it's a good story. So back in the 90s, professor walks in to the sysadmin's office and says, we can't send email more than 500 miles. If you haven't read this story, that, is that the stupidest thing you ever heard? That doesn't make any sense. Like, if you're the sysadmin, you're like, that is the dumbest thing I ever heard. So he starts trying, like, I'm going to send some email. So he sends it to a guy across town, works fine. Sends it a little farther, works fine, right? Tries to send it over 500 miles, doesn't work, no email. Tries, to, he thinks maybe it's like some weird geographic thing. So like, I'm going to send it to my friend, but I know his mail server's in Seattle. So like, I'm going to mail it, it's going to go farther and come back to him, but he's closer than 500 miles, doesn't work. So he goes and pokes around and figures out that a consultant, we all know, some of you may be consultants, I apologize, but you guys, whatever. Um, OK, so a consultant had reinstalled an operating system, upgraded it, and in the process, upgraded or actually downgraded the send mail program, which caused the configuration file that the main guy had put in didn't work anymore. So now all his timeouts were wrong, and it was using basically some default timeout, which in the story is three milliseconds. And if you do the math, three milliseconds is about 500 miles for traveling of light. Now, go read the story, then read the fact, because there's like half the fact is that's not real, right? Like the speed of light in, in copper is not the speed of light in vacuum, and blah, 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 and you wouldn't know until it came back, and so you've got to double, and the guy's like, look, it's a good story, shut up. So, <laughs> Latency is zero. That picture's not from anything. It's just a good picture. Come on. OK. Latency is zero. I used to work at TIBCO, and I made a classic Java programmer distributed computing mistake. We had a situation. We had a primary server, and we had a backup server. Sorry, I'm going in the dark. We had a backup server. When you sent information to the primary server, it would not say it was successful until the backup server had said that it got the data. That was great. And we were smart, and we said, we'll put a timeout. The problem is Java does garbage collection. So sometimes we would say, update from 1 to 2. And the primary would say, update from 1 to 2. And the backup would go. And the primary would time out and say, Whoop, we're staying at 1. But the backup would go to two because, right, that's distributed computing. So the lesson here, latency isn't just about the network, the speed of light. Latency is also about what the other machine's doing, right? And garbage collection, bad. Now, if you went to the Jepson talk earlier, you learned that Elasticsearch did the same thing I did, but they did it with a lot more money. If I made as much as they've had invested, I wouldn't feel bad. I felt a little bad. I don't feel bad anymore. I don't work there anymore. OK. 
Bandwidth is infinite. The network is reliable. Latency is zero. Bandwidth is infinite. I can push as much data through the network as I want. And let me be clear about bandwidth. Ban and a sysadmin told me to make sure I did this. Bandwidth is data over time. So it's how much stuff you can push at a, at a time. We're going to talk in a little bit about the phone company who calls bandwidth data times time, which is the total use of data. But data is bandwidth over time. And it's, it's infinite. So if you have a single server through which everything passes, like a RabbitMQ server or a, some single database or anything like that, and all your data goes to that place, you can do whatever you want because you can push all the data there and get it all back all over the network, all over the internet with no problem. Bandwidth is infinite. So much so that everything can depend on everything else. Now, I'm starting to lie too much. I don't want to say that. So one of the nice things about Hadoop for people who did that, even though it's, I guess, getting out of style, whatever, I'm old. Um, so Hadoop has this thing, let's move the work near the data. And the reason, one reason to do that is instead of moving data all over the network, the data stays where it is. The work is small, kind of like what the last talk was about. I move the work near the data, and I move only the results back, minimizing the amount of bandwidth that I need to run my application. So if we can create things that are separate, we can avoid any problems with the infinite amount of bandwidth that is made available to us by our phone company and the intranets. I didn't miss any fun slides, did I? I don't think so. I don't think I missed any good ones yet. Boom, bandwidth is infinite. You know what? Bandwidth is closer to infinite than latency. Here's the problem with latency. Once two things are this close together, that's it. That's the latency. You can't get better than that latency unless you do something which you will be very rich for if you can do. If you can bypass the speed of light, which, by the way, TIBCO did with their Faster Than Light product, um, FTL, if you can go faster than light, you can avoid latency problems. But latency is fixed, right? It's, it's physics. Bandwidth is money. Latency is a little bit money, but it's mostly physics. Bandwidth is money. If you want to dig a tunnel and put a bunch of fiber, you can move more data over time. So there is one good thing about bandwidth, which is that you can expand it if you have the money to do so. So the network's reliable. Latency is zero. Bandwidth is infinite. And the network is secure. The network is super duper secure. Some of you may have heard about this little problem called Heartbleed. And what happened was there was a little bug, nothing big, where you could send a request to a server and say, I'm sending you a packet that's 1,000 whatever bytes. And then you just send them one byte. And they'd say, OK, here's your 1,000 bytes. And so you'd get a random 999 bytes back from whatever was in memory. Now, that wouldn't seem too bad, except most of the time, people's SSL stuff is near their authentication stuff. So you might get a password. You might get a username. You might get something good. Heartbleed, a little bit scary, just a little, right? It's fixed. Don't worry. All servers have fixed Heartbleed. There's no more problems. <laughs> the network is secure. The network is secure. OK, there have been over 10, or 30, excuse me, over 30 known episodes of someone getting over 100K usernames, account information, whatever, in the last 10 years. eBay lost over 145 million user account somethings recently. Home Depot just said they lost 45 million, like in the last three months. Somebody hacked them. Somebody hacked J.P. Morgan Chase for the last three months or six months. Nobody knows. We don't know, but they got something. We don't know what it is, but it's bad, and we think the other bank had it happen too, but we don't know for sure. The network is secure from hackers. What movie? I gave you a hint. It's not a TV show. Nobody knows? The Great Train Robbery. Thank you. Beautiful movie. Come on, people. The network is secure. Okay. 
The network is secure. <laughs> now, when I made this slide, I thought to myself, I'm going to write down in Google, image search, celebrity photo hack. My wife is sitting right there. That was a mistake, OK? <laughs> so most of you know, probably more than even knew about Heartbleed, know about the celebrity photo hack. The celebrity photo hack happened a little while ago. At first, everybody thought it was iCloud. It turns out it was probably just regular old password hacking. Some people took naked pictures of themselves, put it up on iCloud. I don't understand. My wife's response was, why did they take the pictures in the first place, and why did they put them up on iCloud? I don't know. But they did, and then their password got hacked, and the network is secure. It's reliable. The latency is zero. The bandwidth is infinite. And it's completely and utterly secure. Even better, if you have a problem on, the inter on your network, you oh, no, I, have, I, I forgot. I have one more slide before I do that. Second, topology doesn't change. Now, OK, who knows what this is from? Nobody's going to know. Come on. Key and peel. Come on. I had to come up with a slide just to put this picture in it. OK? <laughs> Who can guess what I want to talk about? The cap theorem. Come on, people. It's a cap. <laughs> OK? OK. Topology doesn't change. One whole part of the cap theorem is all about topology, partition tolerance. It's the part you can't ignore, because it's the one part that's based on the fact that there is a shark, a backhoe, and a guy with a freaking ax out there trying to make your data center not work the way you want it to. Anybody who says the topology doesn't change, I'm even going to say, I just said it. That's terrible. Topology doesn't change. OK. This is a hard one. This is from a game based on a movie. I'll give it to you. It's a Ghostbusters game. I couldn't find a good Ghostbusters picture. Recently, a few years ago, Fog Creek had a problem. Their router decided something about spanning tables. I don't know. I'm not a sysadmin. OK, I'm a programmer. So for me, topology doesn't change. I'm a programmer. Everything's perfect, right? But for the sysadmin, something happened with spanning tables, for those who know what that means. And the network packets started going in a big loop, and everything went to hell, right? They had a big packet flood, they called it, which I think is an awesome name. I could have put a flood. I guess instead of Ghostbusters. I don't know. Topology doesn't change. Topology doesn't change. Sometimes I wanted a guy with, you know, but whatever, plumber. <laughs> Sometimes topology changes in a good way. You do an upgrade. Or maybe you take out a machine you don't need anymore, and you save some money. Recently, the current product I'm working on, we, I admit we had a problem with our deployment script. And it assumed that there were three servers. So when we ran deploy, one, two, three, they're all OK. Good, deploy work. The admin said, we don't need three servers. We only need two servers. We'll take one server, and we'll put it somewhere else and do something good with it. Cool, deploy, fail. Why did the deploy fail? Deploy, fail, because there's only two servers, right? Topology changing can come up just in weird places, right? For reasons you meant to change the topology. Maybe you didn't, maybe you did. If you went to the, um, see now, Jens Jensen. Jen uh, yeah, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. Call me maybe. I love that stuff. Oh, man. If you went to the talk, awesome, terrifying, partitioning, terrible stuff. Topology doesn't change. The network is reliable. Latency is zero. Bandwidth is infinite. The network is secure, and topology doesn't change. I don't even know how much time I have. Let's see. There is one administrator to take care of you, though. That was when I meant to do my intro before, but I messed up. So there's one administrator, one guy you have to talk to no matter what. Right? Am I right? Maybe you work at a company with one guy. You're the administrator. <laughs> Not me. I work at a company with a whole bunch of systems. I'm like, OK, I want to do the deployment. Deploy, system one, failed. You don't have authentication. Hey, can I get authentication to system one? Cool, thanks. Do, 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 deploy. Boom, failed, system two. Hey, can I get authentication to system two? OK, good. You see where this goes, right? So there's authentication across things. Now, if you want, you can work at a company where they have single sign-on, which gets you to the picture. 
One of the single sign-on systems, Kerberos, named after Cerebus, something like that, the guardian to the gates of hell, who was defeated soundly by Harry Potter. Come on, people. Harry Potter and Hermione and the other guy. <laughs> there is one administrator, and his name is Edward Snowden. OK, look, no politics. If you have an administrator, they can do bad things. They can do good things. In the case of a company or a government agency, bad is whatever you don't want, right? In the case of the country, maybe it's what you did want. I'm not saying anything about Edward Snowden, good or bad. But he did take a lot of documents from here and put them over here, and the people who owned this machine were very unhappy. <laughs> right? So there is one administrator. In fact, he was one of thousands of administrators? I don't even know, man. That's all my money, too, tax dollars. There is one administrator. Boom. OK, what's the reference? Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles, you got it. For those who can't tell, the guy holding the gun on the left is the guy on the left, <laughs> like that. OK, in 2008, in San Francisco, there was a network administrator named Terry Childs. He built this fiber WAN that was awesome, I guess. That's what everybody says, including him. He built this awesome thing, and then they kind of pushed him out. And somebody else took over. There was a kerfuffle. I don't know what happened. I don't know who was in the right or wrong. But Terry Childs walked away with all the passwords to all the routers for the fiber WAN that nobody else knew. So San Francisco could not manage its own network. They put Terry Childs in jail. He said, I will give the passwords to the mayor, Gavin Newsom, who's now the lieutenant governor, who's probably going to be president someday. I'm just saying. So Gavin had to go to the jail and ask, can you give me the passwords? He said, sure, I'll give you the passwords. Boom, here they are. They got control of their network again. Right? There's one administrator. Uh, kind of scary if he has the passwords. Great scene, by the way, great movie. Blazing Saddles. I'm going to give it an ad. Bam. Transport cost is zero. <laughs> the network is reliable. Latency is zero. Bandwidth is infinite. The network is secure. Topology doesn't change. There's one administrator. And transport cost is zero. That's why Netflix paid Comcast to improve the performance of their streaming. Not, you know, not to pay for the streaming or anything, just to maybe something. I don't know. And you might think, well, that's nothing. But they also paid Verizon, they paid AT&T, and they paid, I think, other companies as well for the same thing, to get more transport. Transport cost is zero. Boom. Nobody knows what the, OK. This is a picture from the Tour de France. I wish I had a prize for whoever could name the guy in green. No, come on, please. Contador is about half his size. It's Peter Sagan. OK. I won't ask you who the other guy is, because there's no chance. OK, here's the thing. Transport cost is zero. About six or seven years ago, hotel Wi-Fi wasn't that great, like it is today. I mean, today it's good, you know? So. <laughs> I used to travel a lot more, and I went and got myself a little mobile broadband. And I said, well, if I'm going to get a mobile broadband, what I don't want to do is pay for the data. I want to pay a price, and that's it. So I went and looked around, and Sprint said, we'll give you mobile broadband. 3G, 5 gig limit. 4G, all you can eat. Sign me up. Got it. Boom. A couple years later, my wife went to Cleveland to visit her parents. The Tour de France was on. For those who don't know, the Tour de France involves, for the fans, three to six hours of watching TV for 22 days in a row in the summer, in July. So you basically can't work during that time, because you, if you have a TiVo, you can watch it at night, but it's literally your whole life for that time, let alone for the athletes, you know, whatever. They get paid. I watch this because I love it. So my wife sets up the thing. I said, make sure you're on 4G. So she goes, and you know it's up here, and it's over there, and it's 4G, and it's great. And we get our bill, $400. I'm like, what the hell? $400? Unlimited 4G. I call Sprint. Oh, we changed that. You didn't tell me change. Oh, we told you. 
I go through all my bills on the back in little bitty text, no longer unlimited. I canceled that. Okay, transport cost is zero. Just think of Peter Sagan. That's the guy eating your money. <laughs> transport cost is zero. One way to think about transport cost is latency. You can also think of it as bandwidth, but like I said, you can buy bandwidth. You can't really buy latency too well. So the way you get latency is by something the high-frequency traders call bit f-word something. I can't say it, and I might get in trouble. So bit twiddling. That's not what it is. <laughs> I used to work at TIBCO, and I worked on a product called FTL. Like I said, it moves faster than light. It was a brilliant messaging thing. But in order to do FTL, and in order to get latencies under a microsecond, when accessing memory is measured in tens of nanoseconds, you just you can't use locks. You only, you know, like the time of a message round trip was the equivalent of 20 mutex locks. Like you can't use locks. You can't do it, right? You have to just get down in every line of code, go, can I get rid of that line of code? Can I do it? It's very expensive and very painful. But transport cost is zero. The network is reliable. Latency is zero. Bandwidth is infinite. I want to make sure I go in the right order. Network is secure. Topology doesn't change. There is one administrator. And transport cost is zero. The network is homogeneous. Who believes the network is homogeneous? This is the easiest one. Come on, nobody believes this anymore. I mean, you're here. You've got a phone, and you're trying to do Wi-Fi. You know it's not homogeneous. Let me give you my thing. What's the movie? It's Tron, yeah. Tron Legacy. What do I know? Come on. <laughs> I just looked for a picture that reminded me of those people with fiber optics to their house. If any of you are those people, I don't talk to you. <laughs> OK? I pay a cable company a nice monopoly amount of money to get crappy connection to my house. Right? But not everybody has that. Most people today have phones. <laughs> the network is homogeneous, which is why Facebook paid some ungodly billions of dollars for WhatsApp, which actually runs on phones that aren't smartphones, right? And other things. Because writing an app to run on smartphones isn't as hard as writing an app to run on some weird Nokia thing that somebody in the middle of who knows where is using. Who knows? Saved by the bell. You know all of them. You're as old as me. You can't answer anymore. You can't answer anymore. <laughs> Saved by the bell. Who remembers those phones? Man, I wanted one of those phones. Those were the coolest when they came out. I mean, come on. OK, the network is homogeneous. Oh, this is the hardest one, too. Westworld. Oh, come on. <laughs> You're right. OK, fine. So the network is homogeneous, which is why Google bought a company, App Purify or something? And they also built into the new Chrome network simulators, which Mac also has in their network system, systems preferences panel, if you want to play with it. Network simulators, so you can try what it's like to run your app on a system that doesn't have the same bandwidth as the network you're actually on. And if you're a web programmer, that's a really great thing to do. If you're a mobile developer, that's a really great thing to do. If you happen to work in a data center where everything is perfect and you have fiber interconnects between all of your machines and multiple private networks with routers and bridges, I don't want to talk to you anymore, and that's fine. But there are simulators. Also a good movie. So those are the eight fallacies. How do I do on time? Good. The network is reliable. Latency is zero. Bandwidth is infinite. The network is secure. Topology doesn't change. There's one administrator. Transport cost is zero. And the network is homogeneous. There's also a monitor right there I could look at instead of looking at the screen. Yeah. So those are the eight fallacies. They really capture right the problems with distributed computing. I mean, if you went to any of the other talks, something they were talking about is because of one of these. Somebody ignored one of these or intentionally just bypassed one of them or didn't think, or somebody's making a lot of money by fixing these, right? I mean, like, you can't fix them, but somebody's out there going, you know, latency isn't zero, so I'm going to be smart and make something that's low latency. And then I'm going to sell it to high-frequency traders and make lots and lots and lots and lots of money. So a couple things from the real world. 
I listened to some talks, and I'm glad. Corba's dead, I think. RMI's almost dead. But here's the problem with Corba and RMI and all the other distributed object systems and all the things where people say, hey, we're going to hide the network from you, is that everything that hides the network from you hides all of the fallacies from you, right? And they're all there. I mean, it hides all the realities is what it really hides. So it assumes all the fallacies and says, no, no, no. You can just make an object and send messages to it. It's fine. It's not fine. Um, a simple thing. I mean, I just think about this. Like, I used to teach distributed objects on Next. It was the coolest thing in the world. I mean, I did a great demo where, like, in three lines of code, you're sending messages between apps. I mean, it was awesome. How did you set the timeout? No, oh, there was no timeout. OK, web sockets and polling. So, you know, things like latency and reliability require things like reconnecting and other things. And you've got to think about that, right? They also require things like timeouts, which means that if you want to, you can cheat and set timeouts so all your tests pass, and then somebody garbage collects, and then your tests, you know, your production fails. So timeouts, a good way to get around a lot of the realities of networking, but not so good. The bottom line is you should trust physics, OK? That's why I went and got a PhD in nuclear engineering, so that I could do computing. Right? That's why. Now I understand. Like, copper, speed of light. OK, I got it. Good. OK, trust physics, read the docs, and then test if the docs are true. I don't know. Some people don't tell the truth in their docs. And the truth is, unless you're running on real-time systems, all of the things about latency are real. They can happen on the other side. If you're on a real-time system, then maybe they won't happen on the other side. Maybe they'll only happen in the middle. But I don't work on real-time systems, and I'm going to bet that 99% of the people in the room don't work on real-time systems. And I mean hard real-time systems. I don't mean the ones that, you know, like as software developers, we say we're going to do some real-time Java or something like that. So I would highly suggest everybody go back and watch the Gypsum 2 Electric Boogaloo talk, which is a reference to Break Into Electric Boogaloo, which is also maybe not a great movie. Certainly not as good as the original break-in. So those are the fallacies. Let's be careful out there. Hill Street Blues, Hill Street Blues thank you. OK, questions, comments, or just applause? <laughs>